Hi everybody, this is the behavior and mental status review that goes along with your reading. In terms of history taking uh, with behavior and mental status, this is not like just about every other system where you can uh, inspect, percuss, or palpate. This is generally very subjective. Um, as you're talking to your patient, and this goes with any patient, you'll be able to figure out pretty quickly whether they're or not they're alert, uh, what their mood is, uh, orientation, their ability to focus and pay attention, and what their short-term and long-term memory might be. As well, you'll be able to figure out what their insight, the ability to make good judgment, and then if there's a thought disorder or disorder of perception that might be uh, on board with this patient. Some terminology that is important to know, and again, all of this is in your book. Uh, dealing with level of consciousness, uh, this is how aware the person is of his or her environment. And there's, um, in uh, chapter 17 in the nervous system, there's a, a table on level of consciousness and arousal there. But uh, attention, this is again the ability to focus and concentrate. Sometimes what we have difficulty in with, uh, with going to school, but this is where there's a, a lack or, or ability to focus and concentrate depending on uh, whether it be a pathological or a um, environmental issue. Checking to see if a patient is alert. This is uh, if the patient is awake and aware, again, of their sur surroundings. Uh, if a patient's lethargic, this is where you have to speak to the patient um, by name and in a loud voice in order to get that response. Uh, usually these Patients are drowsy, but once they open their eyes and they look at you, they can respond to the questions, and then once you're done, they can go, they'll fall back asleep. However, the patient's obtunded, this is where you have to uh, shake the patient gently, almost as if you were awakening a sleeper. You know, you're, uh, maybe your little one or your teenager trying to get to school, having to wake them up that way. Uh, whereas an obtunded patient, they'll be able to open their eyes and look at you uh, but they would respond slowly and sometimes even be a little confused. Now, if a patient is in a stupor or they're stuporous, uh, the patient is unarousable except by painful stimuli. And typically, this is where we'll do the uh, sternal rub. And of course, if the patient is in a coma, the patient is completely unarousable. When you're dealing with memory, and again, memory is the process of recording and retrieving information. Dealing with short-term memory, that will cover events and memories that occurred from minutes to days ago, whereas long-term deals with those events or memories that occurred from months to years ago or before. And orientation is the uh, if they're aware of who they are, that's aware to person, uh, aware of where they are, that's orientation to place, and then what time it is, uh, orientation to time, is what's ha where are they at now, uh, what's happening now. Uh, sometimes, this is where if you do alert and oriented uh, times three, here's a person, place, and time. Uh, there'll be some literature that you'll see uh, A and O, or alert and oriented times four, and the only addition to that is event. Continuing with more terminology is perceptions, and that's the uh, patient's awareness of the objects in the environment according to the five senses and their interrelationships. So for example, um, a normal perception is if you're uh, the sense of smell, like, oh, I'm smelling warm chocolate chip cookies, and then they can relate that to baking chocolate chip cookies. And if they're in an environment where they're baking those warm chocolate chip cookies, then that would be an appropriate perception. Now thought processes, these are the logic, coherence, and relevance of a patient's thoughts uh, and how those lead to those thoughts and goals. So basically this is how people think. So the how and how people think. Dealing with patient's insights, this is awareness that the thought, symptoms, or behaviors, whether they be normal or abnormal. So for example, uh, distinguishing that a daydream or a hallucination is not real. 
And uh, judgment, this is the process of comparing and evaluating different possible courses of action. So here, this is where you're able to determine if a patient has uh, appropriate judgment that a normal, healthy, be, mental health, health healthy patient uh, would be able to make. So how a prudent person would be able to make based on being in the same situation. So a patient's affect is the observable mood uh, that would be expressed through facial expressions, body movements, and their voice uh, that's associated with the mood. Now, mood in itself, you can explore a patient's mood by um, asking the patients what's their usual mood level and how has it varied with certain life events because as um, situational events occur, would well, depend on a patient's mood. I think we've all can uh, relate to that, of course. Um, you know, if, say, a patient's going through a specific um, stressful life event, you can ask them open-ended questions, yeah, how do you feel about that? Um, or even generally, how is your overall mood? And uh, you would expect that their mood would relate to their facial expression, for example, or their affect. Uh, so <clears throat> some terms to know is euthmic, and that's considered normal, meaning certain things will be make you happy, certain things will make you sad, or sometimes right in the middle, but euthmic is normal. Whereas dysthymic is a sad or depressed, and manic is more, uh, more elated. So you would want to be able to document that a patient's mood is con or affect is congruent with their mood. So uh, an example of their affect not being congruent with their mood we'll use voice for example for purposes of uh, of this audio lecture is if, if a patient was if they're expressing that their uh, mood is dis depressed or dysthymic and you would ask so how, how are you feeling you'd expect them to say you know I'm, I'm kind of depressed or I'm feeling kind of sad or I'm feeling low today versus a non-congruent affect with their mood is to the effect of yeah, I'm depressed. I'm really, I'm feeling super sad today. So you be able to, that you want them to be uh, congruent with each other. Language, of course, is a, a symbolic system for expressing written and verbal thoughts, emotion, attention, and memory. And if you're working with higher functioning or higher cognitive functions, uh, this is dealing with level of intelligence that's uh, assessed by vocabulary, knowledge-based, uh, calculations and abstract thinking as opposed to its counterpart of concrete thinking. So uh, the mental status exam will involve appearance and behavior, speech and language, the patient's mood, their thoughts and perceptions, and cognitive functions. So you're checking memory, attention, how they can process information, what their vocabulary is, those calculations, uh, abstract thinking and constructional ability and we, we mean by constructional ability is for example to be able to um, copy a uh, let's say a circle inside of a square for example that they can then do be able to translate that onto paper themselves when you're looking over appearance and behavior you're looking at their level of consciousness is a patient awake and alert, or are they lethargic and obtunded, or, or obtunded, for example? Um, does the patient understand your questions? Now, it's important to make sure that if there's a language barrier that you're getting the appropriate resources uh, so that you can communicate with your patient. You don't want to say that they, they're not able to, they're not, their level of consciousness is compromised because they're maybe not understanding uh, your questions. You want to see, does the patient respond appropriately and reasonably quickly, or do they lose track of the topic that you're discussing? Uh, do they fall silent or even asleep? Now, if the patient does not respond to your questions appropriately, then you would have to then escalate the stimulus in certain steps. So then going through from, uh, of course, being able to walk in to a patient's room and using a normal tone of voice to discuss with them, um, then you can then go up to the next one if they were more lethargic again speaking uh, by the or 
discussing the patient's name, but in a loud voice, so calling them out in a louder voice. And then if they were more uh, obtunded, then having to gently shake the patient. Looking at posture and motor behavior, does the patient just lie in bed or do they prefer to walk around? Now, for example, if the patient uh, was more in a, um, a manic state of mind or a mood, uh, they'll have a lot of energy or if they're anxious. Uh, so is that something that they just need to walk around as, as you're discussing um, certain topics with the patient or are they able, able to lie still in bed or, or sitting in a chair? Uh, if the patient is sitting or lying, uh, are they comfortable or are they fidgeting in their chair or in the bed? Is the patient agitated with repetitive movements? You also want to assess the patient's dress, their grooming, and personal hygiene. So generally, uh, with grooming and hygiene will deteriorate if a patient is, uh, say, more depressed or if they have symptoms of uh, schizophrenia. And then again, looking at the patient's affect, their facial expressions. So a little, uh, we call flat affect is uh, more of a lack of facial movement. And that can be seen due, sometimes due to physical reasons. Let's yeah, say if the patient has a Parkinson's disease or if it's a psycho, uh, psychological problem, um, if say if they were very, very depressed. Another thing too, and this is more for our psych mental health specialty, but at the same time, it's important to know no matter where you're at, uh, some, some medications can cause a flat affect. So you also want to assess the patient's manner, affect, and relationship to the to people and things around them. So again, we touched on this a few slides ago, but does their affect reflect their mood? Uh, is their affect stable or is it labile? So meaning does their mood change from happiness to tears and back quickly? Or is it a, a smoother transition as if uh, how your conversation is going. And at the same time, you're looking for any uh, hallucinations. Does the patient seem to see or hear things that you do not? And it, sometimes it's important just to ask the question straight out. Do you hear or see things that people say aren't there? That can kind of give you, as, a, as the examiner, a lot of insight as well. Assessing their speech and language, looking at the uh, quantity of speech. So is the patient really talkative or do they seem more silent? Um, are their comments more spontaneous or do they only respond uh, from direct questions to, from you? Looking at the rate, is it too fast or is it too slow? Uh, sometimes slow speech will be a sign of depression whereas that uh, faster or accelerated rapid loud speech would be more from uh, a manic or mania patient. Uh, volume, again, is it loud or is it soft? Uh, in their articulation of words. So are the words that are spoken clearly and distinct? Or um, is there, say, a nasal quality of the speech? So, for example, things that we're looking at is uh, dysarthria, so which refers to uh, defective articulation. Or we know that aphasia refers to a disorder of language. And then there's a table in your, in your book, uh, Disorders of Speech, that you could definitely want to review. In terms of speech fluency, that we're looking over at the rate, flow, and melody of speech. So you want to be alert for abnormalities of spontaneous speech. Like if, say, the patient um, has hesitancies or there are gaps in their flow and rhythm of words, uh, sometimes this will be seen in our uh, CVA or stroke patients with aphasia. Uh, disturbed inflections, like very monotone uh, in, their, in their responses. And we'll see this in our severely depressed patients or even our schizophrenic patients. Uh, looking at circumlocutions, uh, which is a, a phrase or sentence that are substituted for a word that the person cannot think of. Okay, so... Uh, for example, if you're discussing uh, writing with a pencil and uh, you made a mistake and you want to use the eraser, instead of saying eraser, the person might say, that, you know, that thing that you block out your writing with. Or um, uh, another one would be, instead of using the word 
pen, like I'm writing with a pen, they might say that thing that you write with. Uh, paraphages, uh, these are uh, words that are malformed. So, for example, if the person says, uh, instead of using uh, the word pen, I, I write with a den. So it might be malformed. Uh, it might be completely wrong. I write with a branch. Or I write with a bar. Or it might be invented. So, for example, I write with a dar. What does that mean? I don't know. That's uh, a word that might be invented by the patient. When you're assessing mood, you want to ask open-ended questions, and this allows you to explore the patient's perceptions of his or her mood. So things like, how are you feeling today? Or how do you feel about that? Um, sometimes you have to uh, ask a family member how they have been normally, or if how they're presenting, is this their normal mood? Um, asking about how long the patient's been feeling that way. Um, how good or bad has the patient felt when they've been in this uh, particular mood. And it's also important um, that you can ask other questions related to suicide. It's important that um, with just about across the lifespan, there'll be symptoms of depression potentially or other um, mood or thought disorders depending on uh, the patient demographics that you're working with. But it's important to ask and figure out their risk of suicide. So you can ask them um, if they come in saying that they're depressed. You can ask them questions like, do you get pretty discouraged uh, normally? And again, how do you feel? How does that make you feel? Um, what do you see for yourself in the future? Uh, do you ever feel like life just isn't worthing or, or, uh, worth living or that you just rather be dead or maybe not wake up from the procedure? Just Maybe it'd be easier that you just didn't wake up the next morning. Um, you can ask then, but being very direct with the patient, have you ever thought about hurting yourself? Have you ever thought about killing yourself? And it's important that you ask these questions, one, not only to uh, assess the risk of suicide, um, because sometimes if by asking, just asking the question, that can uncover how the patient's really feeling. Of course, if the patient does say that they are uh, suicidal, it's important to assess their risk of um, uh, lethality, again asking them do they have a plan. So if the patient feels like they are suicidal, it's important to ask if they have a plan and if they have the means to carry out that plan. So if you're able to keep these open-ended questions going, um, you're able to demonstrate your interest in the patient and their uh, concern for the patient, um, especially when it comes to possible life-threatening problems. When you're assessing thought disorders, uh, or thought disorders and dealing how they process these thoughts, are they logic, are they relevant, are they organized, and are they coherent? So some terms that we use in, in terms of abnormalities in thought processes is uh, circumstantiality. And this is where um, speech is characterized by indirection and delay in reaching the point because of unnecessary detail. Uh, that have no connection to the point. A lot of times we'll have this with patients that are uh, dealing with obsessions. Derailment, uh, this is also known as loose associations, is a speech in which a person will sh shift topics with no apparent relation um, to those topics. And that uh, can be seen in our manic episodes, other psychotic disorders including uh, schizophrenia. Flight of ideas, this is um, almost a continuous flow of accelerated speech in which a person changes abruptly from topic to topic. Now the changes are usually based on understandable associations, uh, plays on words or distracting stimuli, but the ideas uh, do not progress, um, progress rather in a, a sensible conversation. So generally we'll see this with our manic patients. Neologisms is uh, invented or distorted words uh, or words that have new and highly idiosyncratic um, meanings. So sometimes we'll be seen in um, aphasic patients dealing with stroke, or you might see it in, say, psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia.
if they have uh, incoherent thought processes, this is um, speech that is incomprehensible because it's it's illogical, doesn't make any sense. Um, you'll have shifts in meaning uh, with occur within the conversation. Um, sometimes if a patient does have flight of ideas, though, if it's in a real severe manner, uh, it may produce that incoherence. And a lot of times in our uh, psychotic disorders like schizophrenia, you'll hear this. If the patient has uh, blocking thought processes, there's a sudden interruption of speech, um, say mid-sentence, uh, or before completing the idea. And uh, a lot of times a person will attribute that mid-sentence or mid-sentence interruption or the uh, or stopping before the idea um, to just losing the thought. Now, if that sounds familiar to you, sometimes this is normal. So um, sometimes it can be more obvious uh, and very um, exaggerated in schizophrenic patients. However, as I'm with even with some of these these lectures that I'm putting together, ooh, I'll lose a thought. Um, so it's a matter of uh, just knowing that it, sometimes this is normal, but if it's an everyday occurrence or with every conversation, then you want to start looking at their uh, blocking thought process. Now, confabulation is kind of what it sounds like. You're fabricating facts um, in order to hide um, memory impairment. Now, um, you can see this in Korsakoff syndrome from alcoholism, or sometimes even as patients, just their memory start to go. Um, usually, sometimes in the first um, few stages of Alzheimer's dementia, they'll uh, come up with ideas or these just make things up just in order to um, hide those um, thoughts of impairment. So, for example, uh, in a, if you're working with someone that has uh, early on stages um, of the Alzheimer's dementia, um, you might ask them, for example, well, what what did you what did you do today? And instead of saying, you know, I I don't really remember, they might say something like, oh, you know, the usual, this is my everyday my everyday thing. So it's important that um, if there, any of these things are suspicious to you, that you uh, look into them a little bit further. Uh, uh, perseveration. This is the persistent repetition of words or ideas usually in our psychotic disorders like schizophrenia. Echolalia, this is a rep uh, repetition of the words or phrases of others. So uh, sometimes our kids will do this with us. Um, or maybe if you grew up with a, with a younger sibling, they'll repeat everything you say. Um, sometimes it's called echo. I'm not sure what it's called now, but um, one way to to figure this out is uh, if you're walking the patient to the room and you say, oh, how are you today? And then they repeat, how are you today? Okay, stop and think. Well, maybe well, maybe that was just a, that's an outlier. But then if you ask them, I'm doing wonderful, how about you? And then they say, I'm doing wonderful, how about you? Then you probably have an echolalia going on here. <laughs> now, with these, if this is a true echolalia, uh, you don't want to... Uh, keep diving further into this because sometimes uh, they be can uh, become more irritable if you uh, almost like as if you're playing with them and a lot of times this echolalia will occur in our uh, manic episodes and schizophrenic patients uh, clanging is choosing a word on the basis of sound rather than meaning um, this is in our psychotic disorders uh, such as schizophrenia and sometimes you will see this in manic episodes so the example that your book will give is uh, look at my eyes and nose wise eyes and rosy nose two to one the eyes have it now if you've ever read a dr seuss book here you go clanging this is perfect um, it's a great rhythm um, it, almost made up words uh, that have a good sound to it. So uh, clanging will occur in a lot of psychotic disorders such as schizophrenia. Then moving on to assessing thought content, 
Um, you want to do this uh, throughout your interview by following, of course, appropriate leads as they occur. So if, a, if something comes up, uh, again, that raises that suspicion or raises that red flag, then you can... Because they're just fear. Now, delusions are false fixed beliefs that are not shared by other members of the person's culture. Now, that's, that's uh, important. So, there's, uh, you just want to know some examples of these delusions, of a delusion of persecution, grandeur, or jealousy. If the person has delusions of reference, then the person um, would believe that... Um, a person that has external events, objects, or people have that a particular unusual personal uh, significance. So, for example, that the radio or television uh, might be giving them instructions to that person. If they have delusions um, that are being controlled by an outside force, they may also have somatic delusions. So, if they f believe that they have a disease, a disorder, or even a physical defect that the patient does not have, or that they might have a, a, a systemized delusion, and that's a single delusion with many elaborations, uh, or a cluster of related delusions around a single theme. So these are all systemized into a very complex network. So for example, um, the patient might feel that the K, uh, KGB is after them. And they will be able to tell you the ins and outs and whys and hows, um, which can be pretty impressive uh, if you're interviewing someone with this type of thought content abnormality. Here's a good question for you. Is the following statement true or false? When assessing the patient's thought content, it is important to always follow specific questions to keep the person or the patient on task. And the answer to that is false. When you're assessing a patient uh, and their thought content might have some abnormalities to it, you want to follow those appropriate leads when they occur versus using a specific set list of questions. When dealing with abnormalities of perception, so one, perceptions in itself is you want to figure out if these perceptions that a patient has, if they're false or not. So if a person, for example, we've already uh, talked about assessing if people see or hear things um, that other people may not know. Another question you can ask is, do you know things that people don't know? So if you're assessing, say, a patient's voices, um, you, when you, you can assess and ask questions such as, when you heard those voices speaking to you, what did they say and how did it make you feel? 
Or you can ask questions like, so after you've been drinking a lot, do you ever see things that people say aren't really there? Or sometimes after major surgery like this, people hear peculiar or frightening things. Have you experienced anything like that? So this allows you to figure out if there's um, an abnormal perception. So you definitely want to know the differences between illusions and hallucinations. Whereas we know that an illusion is a mis misinterpretation of actual real external stimuli. So for example, when the person, uh, your, your male person leaves their mail, um, the, if the patient thinks that uh, they left something in there to poison me. So they have an illusion of an actual real event. So they actually physically saw the postman or postperson put the mail in the mailbox. But an illusion is that they thought, well, whatever they put in the mailbox is going to poison me. A hallucination is a subjective external stimuli uh, in the absence of the actual relevant external stimuli. So you can get this from auditory, visual, olfactory, gustatory, or even tactile. Um, some examples of this, uh, Abe Lincoln speaks to the patient from the back of the penny. Or um, the, the other thing too is that they maybe even see spiders crawling on the wall. So visual hallucination. So that could also be drug induced, right? Medication induced. Um, you do not want to include false perceptions associated with dreaming and falling asleep. Because we know that's a little bit different. So if the patient says, well, yeah, I was, when I'm sleeping, I feel like these dreams are very vivid. But if they can express to you that they know that they are dreams and they are not real, they're not reality, it's a big difference. So hallucinations uh, can occur in delirium. Less commonly, although it's still in dementia, but less common, Patients can have this in post-traumatic stress disorder, alcoholism, and other psychotic issues such as schizophrenia. Here's a question. Which of the following is true about hallucinations? A, the person experiences uh, may or may not be recognized by the person as false. Hallucinations may be auditory, visual, olfactory, gustatory, tactile, or somatic. They do not include false perceptions associated with dreaming and falling asleep. Or D, all of the above. Of course, if you answered all of the above, you would be correct. One of the first questions that we even ask a patient uh, can really give you some insight and information on the patient's insight. So, for example, what brings you in today? How can I help you today? When uh, a patient has um, a psychotic disorder, a lot of times they'll lack insight into what brings them in or into their illness. So you'll uh, also figure out that if there's any denial of impairment, that might also accompany some neurologic disorders. When you're assessing judgment, um, you're doing this by noting the patient's responses to specific uh, life events, a lot of times dealing with stressors. Um, so, if a, for example, a patient comes in, you say, oh, what brings you in today? You know, I'm really, I'm, I'm having some chest pain because I'm really stressed at work. So, uh, questions that you can ask about, so how are you going to manage if you lose your job? Or how are you going to manage if you continue uh, with this job? Or if a lot of times finances have a lot to do with this too. So who's going to take care of your financial affairs while you're, say, maybe in surgery, if that was, you know, if, as just an, as an example. Uh, patients that have poor judgment sometimes will have uh, delirium, maybe dementia, uh, mental delays, and some psychotic states. Now things like anxiety, mood disorders, intelligence, education, income, and cultural values will also influence judgment. It's also important to know that just disorientation in general is common if memory or attention is impaired, uh, like you'll see in delirium patients. When you're assessing cognitive functions, you want to again assess orientation to person, place, and time, so A and O times three. So some questions um, when you're asking uh, about 
orientation to person. You have the patient state their own name and maybe the names of the relatives um, that are with them at the same time. To assess orientation of place, asking the patient uh, about the patient's residence, maybe the name of the hospital or the clinic that you're in, or maybe even city or state. And orientation to time, asking them about what time of the day it is, um, what's the day of the uh, day of the week, the month, the season, maybe the date and the year, or how long they've been in the hospital. Now, if say if you're working at a place that um, for example, let's say a nursing home that they may not get out as much, so they may not even be, uh, they may not even care about what day or what time uh, or what week or what month it is. Sometimes you can even ask them, so is it daytime or is it nighttime? In order to assess attention, you can do um, a digital span, so basically giving the patient um, a list of numbers and then you want them to recite those back to you. Uh, you can do serial sevens, and this is to ask the patient to subtract seven from one hundred. Now it's important, of course, without using a calculator. So if you are though are going to assess serial sevens, it's important that you know the answers to the serial sevens. So if you get poor performances here, uh, that might result from just delirium, maybe late stages of dementia, um, loss of calculating ability, any anxiety or depression. Uh, you may also want to consider the possibility of limited education. Uh, spelling backwards, so you can have the patient, uh, you can give the patient a word and you want them to spell it backwards. To assess remote memory, you want to ask about past historical events. So remote memory might be impaired in the late stages of dementia. Assessing recent memory by asking about something recent, um, <clears throat> so whether the national event. So recent memory can be impaired in dementia and delirium. Amnesic disorders um, can impair memory or new learning abilities and reduce a person's social or occupational functioning, but they do not have the global features of delirium or dementia. Uncommon but still important to note. And then uh, anxiety and depression or mental delay can also impair recent memory. You also want to assess their ability to learn something new. And you want that, uh, you can do that by giving them uh, three or four words to remember. And then you go on to say another, another topic and then you'll come back and ask them uh, to repeat those words. That's usually after about say three to five minutes. So here you're going to note the accuracy of the response, awareness of whether, whether or not it's uh, correct, and any tendency to confabulate or to come up, make up things. Um, so normally a person should be able to remember the words. In terms of higher cognitive functions, so through your conversation, again, you'll be able to assess these uh, if the patient has higher cognitive functions. Um, here you're looking for information and vocabulary, their calculating ability by asking the patient to perform a difficult calculation such as uh, if you had a dollar's worth of nickels and someone needed 65 cents, how many nickels would you have left? Um, another way of even is um, what is 4 plus 3, 8 plus 7, then moving on to a little more difficult uh, in multiplication, maybe five times six, nine times seven, and then uh, asking them a little bit more uh, difficult questions using like say two digit numbers, such as uh, 15 plus two, 12 or 25 times six. Um, you can even have them look over longer written examples, so word problems. Looking at abstract thinking, here you can have them interpret proverbs. So an example here is a stitch in time saves nine, uh, or don't count your chickens before they're hatched. So if a patient has concrete responses to these proverbs, because here we're, we're assessing their abstract thinking, uh, you might think that they have a mental delay, delirium, dementia, or it might also be a function of um, limited education. 
At the same time, our patients with schizophrenia may respond concretely uh, or with personal bizarre interpretations. So choose um, proverbs that you understand. So don't, um, don't use proverbs that you may not understand because the patient might just say, you know, I don't know. What does it mean? And if you kind of think, oh, I don't know, it's one of those things that you probably shouldn't be using. Again, uh, if you're asking any of these questions to these patients, you want to make sure that you know the answers and that you can accurately respond uh, in order to assess. Also, you can use uh, similarity exercises. So, for example, you can ask uh, questions like, um, so what do a ball and an orange uh, have in common? Or a cat and a mouse, um, a piano and a violin. So here you're all you're assessing um, abstract thinking. The constructional ability. So here I mentioned in the beginning you can have the patient uh, copy a geometric figure onto a sheet of paper. So uh, your your book actually gives pretty uh, interesting examples of these abnormalities are even having the patient uh, draw a clock and you can give them a specific time um, on the clock that, you, that you're expected. So it's important that they have uh, all the numbers in the appropriate spots and uh, of course the time associated as well. Uh, one thing to keep in mind though if there's a vision or a motor ability or if vision and motor ability are intact uh, poor constructional ability would suggest dementia or a parietal lobe damage. Now at the same time, uh, if say there's, if they have a uh, hemaniopsia um, and they can only draw half of the, the clock, then that can also give you some pretty good insight as well.